Delta 1009 at Delta 27, we are ready. 10. Delta 1009, Delta 27, your startup is approved, 1 to 1 decimal 8. Uh, the fourth and the last lecture of this evening is uh, by Mr. Anis Khan. And uh, he talks about air aviation SMS. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Today I know that I am giving my presentation among aviation enthusiasts. And some of you might be professionals, some of you might be students. But we all have one thing in common, and that is having a deep respect for aviation. Soaring into the sky like a bird is something people have always fantasized about. And it has been in science fiction for a long time. But then, in a single century, science fiction became our reality. And you and me, ladies and gentlemen, with our knowledge, with our skills and passion, we make that possible to fly in the air like a bird. But that would be quite wrong to say like a bird because we do it much better than birds. We fly much faster than them, much higher than them, and last but not the least, more luxuriously than they do. However, sometimes we do make mistakes. And when that happens, things go horribly wrong and the results are catastrophic. So today in my presentation, we will talk about air accidents. Uh, back, back to the Air accident, how they happened, what went wrong, and what could have been done to prevent those accidents. Now, it's hard to talk about the negative, but we've got to talk about it because life is part positive and part negative. We just can't ignore the negative. The correct approach would be to handle it. So, according to the National Transportation Safety Board, uh, one of the most probable cause for air accident is human error. Now, of course, uh, one way to do it right is to do it wrong. That's one way to do it right. But this doesn't apply to aviation industry. In aviation industry, there is no room for error. And when someone does make a mistake, hundreds of people die in the most frightening way possible. So if there is no room for error in aviation industry, how we cope up with that? And the answer is we learn from other people's experience. If an accident occurred, there is an investigation on that as to what went wrong uh, and what could have been done to prevent those accidents. Now, to search for the wreckage of MS370, it cost around $54 million. It is by far the most expensive air crash investigation in history. When US Air Flight 427 crashed near Pittsburgh, the search for answer took the National Transportation Safety Board 10 years to know the cause behind the crash. So why they invest so much of their time and energy into these investigations? Is it worth it? And the answer is yes, but only if you and me know about them. So the purpose of these investigations is not to blame anyone. It is to come up with some viable suggestions and safety recommendations to pilots, engineers, air traffic controllers, and other people involved in running the aviation industry so that it never happens to them. Because uh, it is better to learn from other people's experience than it is to be trapped in such horrific situation. So today in my presentation, we will analyze some of these uh, air accidents. And uh, so first of all, we will talk about the United Airlines Flight 585. Uh, it was operated by a Boeing 737. Uh, the Boeing 737 is one of the most popular passenger jet in the world. Uh, around the globe, the plane has carried 13 billion passengers. Uh, it's the backbone of aviation industry. On March the 3rd, 1991, uh, it was scheduled to fly from Denver to Colorado Spring. Total flight time was 20 minutes, but after 17 minutes, they experienced some turbulence and heavy gusts of wind. And as they lowered their airspeed for their approach into Colorado Spring, the airplane became more vulnerable to the heavy gusts of wind. And as they had the runway inside, uh, they reported it to the control tower. 
It's a standard procedure and it was done by Patricia. Patricia, at age 35, she was the only female pilot in United's history. And her words were the last word that was heard on this flight. Because after that, the Boeing 737 uh, spin out of control. And after 10 seconds, the Colorado Spring has now become the crash site for one of the most mysterious air crashes in history. Rescuer arrived within minutes, but there was no sign of the 737. Um, all that remains was the metal debris of the airplane because the impact forces were so hard that it had severely broken down the airplane. So when the investigators arrived at the crash site, the first thing they noticed was So the first thing they noticed was that the wreckage of the airplane was spread out in a relatively small area. That made it clear that nothing happened to the airplane in mid-air. There was no ground-to-air missile, no mid-air breakup, or anything of that sort. Because if that would have been the case, the wreckage of the airplane would have been quite large. Uh, you can think of it like uh, when a bomb was made to blast on the 747 of Pan Am 103. Uh, now, the Boeing 747 is made out of 6 million parts. So, and the bomb was made to blast at 36,000 feet. Now, you can imagine when the bomb was blasted and all the wreckage settled down on the runway, the search area was as large as the entire London city. But this was not the case with this uh, crash. The area was smaller, so that made it clear that the airplane was in one piece until it hits the ground. Next slide. So the first thing that investigators, the first thing that investigator uh, were suspicious of was human error because human error is the cause for 70% of air accident. So when they were listening to the cockpit voice recorder, they came to know that the crew was remarkably well. They, there was a bit of humor in the cockpit, a bit of tension release. Uh, the, cap, uh, the first officer said that they had some extra speed as a safety margin and the captain agreed to lower the airspeed. So um, the captain did not have any superiority complex, complex where he believed that he is the king of the cockpit and his order should be followed in the cockpit. Um, it doesn't matter if they are wrong, but this captain was um, taking into account the suggestions of his fellow crew member. So the next thing investigators uh, uh, investigated was the engine turbine and when they they observed the wreckage, there was a dirt deep down in the engine turbine. That made it clear that at the time of the impact, the engines were running properly. So if the engines were running properly, was there any problem with the instruments in the cockpit? The investigators examined the plane's hydraulic dial and it was completely destroyed. The glass tower had been broken. The indicator needle had been snapped off by the impact forces. But even these ravaged dials tell the story. At the impact, a dent was placed on the face plane from the indicator needle. That made it clear that at the time of the impact, the engines were indeed working properly and uh, generating enough amount of power. So, next slide. So, they quickly become suspicious uh, after examining the engines, they quickly become suspicious of the, uh, of the flight controls. They become suspicious that they might be suffering some catastrophic failure with their flight uh, controls. And they were suspicious of the rudder at, at the back of the tail. Now here's some uh, basic aerodynamics and I'm sure that you all might be familiar with it, but it doesn't hurt to go over the basics again. Uh, the airplane has uh, six degrees of freedom. The airplane can go forward, backward, left, right, top and down. Now these three motions are linear motions and the other three motions are angular motions. The airplane can roll left or right, it can pitch up or down or it can be yawed. 
So now there are three primary flight control services that are employed to perform these um, motions. Now uh, ailerons are used to roll the airplane and the elevators are used to pitch the airplane up or down and the rudders are used to yaw the airplane. So next. The investigators now examine the most vital elements, the power control unit. The power control unit works like a car power steering. When a pilot gives the rudder input, the PCU uses hydraulic fluid to convert the gentle touch of a pilot's foot into the enormous power, uh, into the enormous pressure needed to move the rudder of the 737. The uh, unit in so it uses hydraulic fuel to move the rudder. Now the heart of the PCU is something called a dual servo ball. And the investigators found chips of uh, metals on the dual servo ball. Uh, it's a disturbing find because uh, if there are chips of metals on the servo wall, it could, it could jam the servo wall, making it impossible to move the rudder. So they quickly sent the servo wall uh, to California for detailed testings. Next slide. So when they sent the servo wall for, to California for detailed testing, the lab report told them that filters are designed to keep the uh, delicate chips of metal out of the delicate area so which, mo which moves the hydraulic fluid and moves the rudder so nothing else was found on, on, on the, uh, on the uh, servo wall that, that explained such accidents so it's been, it's, it's been two years of its investigation where investigators have examined the plane's engines, the instruments and uh, and uh, and the flight controls. Uh, they were back to square one. And for the fourth time in its history, the investigators published a report that does not uh, reach a conclusion. The NDSB published a report which does not reach a conclusion. So, after two years, what happened is a simple happens on US Air Flight 427. And on final approach to Pittsburgh, uh, a 737 rolls to right and after 10 seconds, it crashed. And nothing the pilot do seem to have any effect on the airplane. So, in fact, they seem to be mirror images of each other. On final approach, the United Airlines Flight 585 rolls to left. And on final approach, the United US Air Flight 427 rolls to right. So, the pressure on the NTSB to solve the investigation grows as both the um, both the crashes involved the same kind of airplane, billions of dollars, and perhaps the airline industry was at risk. Because if there had been a third accident with the same airplane, um, and then the safety of this 737 would be at question. So they quickly sent the servo wall of this airplane to uh, for testing, and the results were the same as of the United Airlines Flight 585. They found chips of metals, and lab report told them that filters are designed to keep uh, these chips of metal out of the delicate area. Next. It was a dead end for the investigation, like the previous, uh, like the previous investigation. So after that, next one. After, after these two crashes, um, the investigators finally found the break they were looking for. While at cruising altitude, an Eastwind airline, like 517, rolled to left. And after 10 to 20 seconds of an extreme left bank, the unknown forces let go of the airplane. And the airplane was level again and the captain of the flight uh, declared an emergency that they had some problem with their flight controls and they were experiencing the same problem that the previous flight that we have talked about they, they, had, they had a rather hard over problem but this time unfortunately they, they were able to land the airplane but at this time the investigators had a pilot to talk to 
and an airplane that was in one piece. So they ran some tests and came to the uh, conclusion of the longest air crash investigation. They came to know that under right circumstances, not only the servo wall of the Boeing 737 can jam, it can then function in reverse. So anytime the pilot tries to correct the rollover by applying the opposite rudder, the condition becomes more and more worse. So it's like if you are driving a car and you turn to right and the car start to go left, you would only realize this mode of failure when you are off the road. And this is exactly what these pilots were faced with. Something so unusual that they did not understand what was happening to them. So sweeping changes were made in the aviation industry after this accident. The uh, NTSB called for better training of the pilot to handle the rudder hardover and the rudder reversal. And they also instructed the Boeing to redesign the dual servo wall on, uh, on, on every airplane. So Boeing spent hundreds of uh, millions of dollars to replace the servo wall on thousands of airplanes around the world. So now out of United Airlines Flight 585 and US Air Flight 427, we have a much safer Boeing 737 fleet. So that's the end of the first investigation. And this, uh, now we'll study the LAFA Flight 3142. It was operated by an Argentinian airline called LAFA. And on August the 31st, 1999, it was traveling from Buenos Aires to Cordoba. And there were 95 passengers and 5 crew members. So, as they began their takeoff role, takeoff warning system sounded an alarm in the cockpit that they are not correctly configured for the takeoff. But the pilot ignored the alarm, and by then they had crossed V1. V1 is the maximum takeoff speed after which you cannot abort the takeoff even if the engine fails because there simply isn't enough runway left for you to stop. So after that the pilot tries to rotate the, rotate the airplane after V1 but he could not take the airplane off the ground so he decided to abort the takeoff after V1 but then it was too late trying desperately to stop the jets uh, overshot the runway, crossed through the airport fence and killed people who were traveling in their cars on the road and finally uh, uh, collided with a road construction machinery. There were 60 fatalities and 40 survivors who were severely injured. Next. So before we jump into the investigation, I would like to quickly review two basic things. And number one is flaps. Now flaps are used to provide more lift at slower airspeed. And it does that by increasing the camber of the wing. Now how does it increase the camber of the wing? So for example, we have an airfoil. Now an airfoil is the cross section of the wing. If you take the wing and divide it into a slice, you have the airfoil. So, <coughs> A cord line is a straight line that is drawn from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the airfoil. And a mean camber line is a straight line that is drawn from the uh, that is drawn equally from the upper and lower camber surfaces of the airplane uh, of the airfoil. Sorry. And the camber is the distance between these two imaginary lines. Now, if you add flaps to the airfoil and do the same thing. If you draw a chord line and a mean camber line, you can see that the you can see that the camber of the wing is increased significantly when we add flaps to the wing. So that's how it increases the lift on an airplane. That's how flaps increases the lift on an airplane. Next up. The next thing is throttle. Now there can be two different types of inputs uh, to the throttle. You can increase or decrease these two big quadrants and control the amount of thrust you want into an engine. 
and the, the second input is if you plug these uh, two small quadrants at the back, you initiate what we refer to as the reverse thrust. Now, after initiating the reverse thrust, you can control how much reverse thrust you want by moving these two big quadrants. So if, if the reverse thrust is plugged and you increase the power, you can have more reverse thrust. So next up. So the first thing at the wreckage was uh, the investigators uh, collected the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder and sent it to the lab so that they can extract crucial information from, from these two things. At the meantime, they uh, at the meantime they questioned themselves was the engines of the airplane were working properly and the type of damage sustained by these engines. They came to know that the engines were indeed working properly and generating enough amount of power. So after that they found two unusual things at the wreckage. They came to know that the thrust reversal of Lava Flight 3142 was deployed. Now the thrust reversals are only deployed at landing to slow the airplane down. Using them during takeoff could cause an enormous thrust imbalance, and that is not advisable. You would never use a reverse thrust in, 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 in takeoff. So, and the next thing was that the Lava Flight 3142 did not have extended flaps, their flaps were in zero degree position. So, investigators were astounded as to why the thrust reversers are deployed during takeoff and why. Did Lava Flight 3142 attempted to fly uh, without extending the flaps in the first place? And the answer to all those questions lied in the cockpit voice recorder. So as they were listening to the cockpit voice recorder, they came to know that the flight attendant and the captain, apart from being co-workers, they were good friends. And during the taxi, one of the flight attendants was inside the cockpit uh, chatting with the pilots about what they are going to eat for their dinner and they were talking about their romantic lives. Now that is far and beyond what the pilots are required to do. The moment you start the engines up until you are at 10,000 feet, you are supposed to have a sterile cockpit. And what is meant by a sterile cockpit is that you only talk about the operational procedures, you follow the checklist and you are only concerned about the airplane and not your dinner. They were not even, uh, by listening to the CBR, they came to know that they were not even following any checklist. They were relying on their memory. So the next thing investigators wondered was, now the airplane is designed to give you a warning to any mistakes a pilot could make. So the investigators wondered that the alarm system of this airplane was working properly or not. So as they were listening to the CDR, they heard the alarm loud and clear. And astoundingly, the pilots of Lava Flight 3142 ignored the alarm and believed that their airplane was good to take off. Now the purpose of these alarms is simply to tell the pilots not to take off. It was astoundingly astounding that the, that the captain ignored this alarm. By now the cause of the crash was clear. It, it was human error. It all started with unprofessional behavior in the cockpit which uh, led to the follow, not following the checklist. Now following the checklist is something that's the basis of aviation. Whether you are a Cessna 172 pilot or a Boeing 737 pilot or an engineer, you always follow checklists. So that was a huge mistake that they made and not following the checklist resulted them into forgetting about the flaps, extending the flap. They forgot to extend the flap. And then the fatal of them all, they ignored the alarm and cross the V1. If they would have responded to the alarm, they could have easily uh, abort the takeoff because then, because at that time they did not have crossed V1. They crossed V1 after the alarm. On the 
on uh, in the final report, the NDSP investigators stressed upon the need uh, for pilots to comply with the sterile corporate rule, uh, a rule that restrict crew conversation and distraction in, 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 in the cockpit during the during the peak hours. Uh, that is when you take off and up to 10,000 feet. And investigators also called for better training of, of the cockpit crew to respond to cockpit alarms and and be professional at, at, at their workplace. So with this I come to the end of my presentation and the only outcome I want from my presentation is if there are this number of accidents uh, till 2016, then this means that there are this many number of mistakes that we have already made. And what would happen if you repeat any of these mistakes that have already been being done? The same incident would happen again. So what we can do is make, we can make a commitment to know about these accidents uh, and that is not only to the professionals working in the aviation but also to the students of aviation so that we never repeat the same mistake that have already been done. And you can read all the reports of, of uh, these air crashes on the official website of the NTSB. Now, I appreciate your attention ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Now, if you have any question, you may. Yes, 
Thank you and allow us. 